Hi, uh, thanks to Masashi and everyone for organizing this great uh, workshop. Uh, it's a lot of fun and uh, interesting. So uh, it's a workshop about deep learning. Uh, so deep learning uh, models are basically highly expressive nonlinear models which work very well in practice. So the standard usage protocol uh, these days, uh, it might change, but that's how it works now, uh, is we collect a lot of data, uh, huge data uh, sets. We design large models for this uh, data to do a specific task. And then we train it using uh, SGD, SGDs and SGD and GPUs. Uh, and it works uh, pretty well in practice. Uh, so it's, been, it's an interesting history in the sense that uh, in the 1990s and before, we had pretty much these models. Theory said it shouldn't work, right? Because the problems are uh, hard to optimize and uh, generalize, and in practice it didn't work, so everything was great. Uh, <laughs> but then uh, something changed uh, uh, pretty recently. Theory still said it shouldn't work, but it somehow worked in practice, meaning that we could build uh, models that actually optimize well and seem to generalize well as well. Uh, so what has changed? Uh, we have a lot more data, so that might be important. Uh, we're using slightly different architectures. Maybe that's important. In terms of training algorithms, we're using pretty much the same, you know, plain uh, SGD, or let's say we're using a lot of other things, but uh, SGD seems to work fairly well, more than it did uh, a while ago. Uh, so we'd like to understand this. It's a very nice uh, question for uh, a theory, fairly well posed, and uh, it'll be nice to make progress on it so that we can understand better why things are working and maybe design better models and algorithms. Uh, so key problems in this context, and I'll talk about these uh, 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 here. Uh, one is non-convexity, right? We all know that these uh, training problems, the uh, training problems for deep learning are highly non-convex. They're problems in uh, high dimensional, uh, and you know, this is like the typical hard non-convex uh, problem, uh, potentially has a lot of uh, local minima. So how can we, uh, how can the algorithms uh, find good uh, minima for those? And uh, obviously it's an instance of an NP hard problem in the worst case. Uh, the other problem is that if you look at the models that people are training, uh, they quite often have more parameters than data points, right? So in uh, ML 101, we teach uh, students that if you have uh, a model with uh, you know, more parameters than data points, uh, its VC dimension, et cetera, will uh, probably be such that uh, we, we could uh, overfit badly in the worst case, right, if we know nothing uh, else. Uh, so we need to understand why these large models uh, actually do not overfit, and that's a question that uh, many people recently have uh, uh, been working on. Uh, so the outline of my talk, uh, it'll have three parts. Uh, one is, uh, first part, I'll talk about optimization and give a model where optimization of a, a deep, uh, well, of a nonlinear architecture uh, does find a global, a global optimum. Uh, the other is uh, will have to do with both optimization and generalization. I'll talk about a nonlinear architecture uh, which can both optimize and generalize despite having uh, arbitrarily many parameters. And the third uh, part, which I may or may not get to, uh, uh, we'll have to we'll uh, discuss architectures, namely how can we design the right architecture for a given uh, task. Okay, so let's start. With this is a, 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 a paper we had at ICML this year uh, about globally optimizing convolution and networks with Gaussian inputs. Uh, so the challenge uh, for theory here uh, is uh, that on the one hand, we don't expect uh, neural nets to optimize. Uh, to be trainable for any arbitrary uh, distribution and architecture. We have hardness results uh, that go uh, a long way back and some recent ones by Shamir and others. Uh, so we'd like to find a specific case where uh, deep learning uh, works and we can uh, prove it. Uh, and we'd like to find something that is useful in the sense that the architecture that we prove it for should be something that people actually use in practice. Uh, the other is that the optimization algorithm should be something that's uh, useful and has been shown to work, like uh, uh, SGD or GD, uh, and uh, we want to prove in this setting that finding the global optimum uh, can be done uh, efficiently. Uh, okay, so obviously, as I said before, we don't expect to show this for the general case. If I had a proof that th all these uh, things actually are satisfiable for the general case, I'd be lying or wrong, uh, because we know that that's hard, right? So we need to make some assumptions, uh, but we'd like to make as few assumptions as possible and to keep things uh, relevant. Uh, so I, I think we're pretty far from, uh, you know, fully uh, satisfying uh, this, but uh, uh, w at least in some some of our assumptions, I think are reasonable. 
Uh, okay, so we uh, decided to focus on a pretty uh, uh, useful uh, and highly used uh, architecture, which is convolutional uh, networks, which are uh, pretty uh, standard now in uh, vision uh, models. Uh, so I guess you all know what these are, right? You take uh, uh, the same filter, you apply it to different uh, parts of the uh, image, uh, and uh, then you, you aggregate. Okay, so these are, as I said, they, they appear in many deep learning models. Uh, so how do they differ from fully connected models? One is the notion of parameter tying, right? You use the same uh, chunk of parameters throughout your model, the same filter. Uh, the other is sparsity, namely a, a given filter typically only applies to a subset of the, the image. Uh, so we'd like to, to model these uh, types of effects. Uh, so uh, when we started working on this, it wasn't, I mean, this, this, uh, these types of models haven't been really studied in the context of uh, optimization. Uh, so we weren't even sure which types of continents are easier to uh, or harder uh, to learn uh, and under which conditions. Uh, so not much, I, I guess not more is known now, but not there's still much to understand. Uh, so let me present to you a simple model that captures notions or basic properties of uh, co continents uh, which we uh, study. So within this uh, simple model that I'll describe uh, uh, shortly, uh, we've found the following, that in this simple model, learning with arbitrary input distributions is hard, uh, but learning with Gaussian inputs, namely where the input uh, features are Gaussian uh, distributed in a Gaussian manner, that's tractable using gradient descent, right? So we have this separation between easy and hard learning depending on the uh, input distribution. Uh, so here's the model that we study. It's a simple, if you want, a simple com uh, one hidden layer uh, confnet. Uh, so you have a, a uh, this is the input X, and uh, there's a filter here, uh, W, uh, that's applied to uh, non-overlapping parts of the, uh, of the uh, input, okay? So it's like a, a conv net or a conv layer with where the stride uh, is the same size of the uh, filter, okay? Uh, um right, I'll say something about uh, non-overlapping uh, later. So uh, you apply this filter W, so it's the same filter in for these three uh, parts of the input. You apply a ReLU nonlinearity to it, and then you aggregate uh, with uh, some aggregation. So you uh, you could do max, but we analyzed uh, some. Uh, right. So that that's the model that we study. We call it the non-overlap uh, model. Uh, so it captures some uh, key aspects of continents. Uh, one is parameter tying, since uh, it's the same uh, filter applied throughout. Uh, the other is uh, nonlinear activations and ReLU in particular. Uh, it's interesting that some things uh, you can show with ReLU, but not with other activation functions. So uh, uh, it might actually hint that ReLUs uh, are good for a reason. Okay, uh, we have this intuition that they're good because they're convex as opposed to sigmoid, and they don't uh, saturate. Uh, and you know, the fact that you can prove things for them and not for others is, is maybe encouraging in the sense of understanding why they're used. Does your nasty work you after that? Keep use ReLU like ReLU six? Yeah, 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 no, no. I mean, we haven't tried. But, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess it's, it's like adding another hidden layer, right? I mean, it would be, uh, we use one hidden layer. If you had two hidden layers, you could emulate or simulate the ReLU6 right, by subtracting two ReLUs. Uh, okay, so this is formally our model. This is the uh, W applied to the parts of the input. This is the ReLU. Uh, you sum everything and you, you average uh, by the number of hidden units. Okay. So the learning problem we study is uh, uh, the realizable case, namely where the input, uh, the training data is uh, generated by this uh, specific architecture that we learn with. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about Gaussian distributed inputs later, but let's say that X is generated by some distribution D, uh, and the output is uh, uh, produced using some true weights, unknown weights, uh, W star. Uh, and the goal is to find uh, a W, so this is the goal of the training algorithm. So uh, X uh, are distributed according to D, Y is uh, generated uh, according to W star, and then your goal is to find W such that the squared error between these is minimized. So this is a regression setting as opposed to classification. Um, okay, uh, so this architecture looked so simple that we weren't sure that it actually captures the hardness of learning in ConvNet. Uh, so our first task was to show that this is actually hard, uh, and uh, it's actually uh, technically uh, quite uh, subtle to show, but we could show that 
uh, optimizing this, so solving this optimization problem to within uh, an epsilon that depends on dimension is NP-hard, and we show this by a reduction from a variant of set splitting, which is a, an NP-hard problem. Right, so this is the, the hardness part, uh, and so this is like the bad news, and uh, let's move to the good news. The, the good news is that uh, you can optimize uh, this architecture if you make some assumption about the underlying distribution of the inputs, okay? Just of the inputs, not of the, uh, the weights the themselves. Um, so worst case, it's hard, uh, and uh, we need to make assumptions. So the assumption that we made was that the input distribution is Gaussian, okay? Namely, the features that uh, you, you um, train on, are uh, they come from a Gaussian uh, distribution, okay? Uh, just the input distributions, the input uh, data. So we denote this by G, the, the input distribution. Uh, so under this uh, setting, we can show, and I'll show you next, that uh, uh, even gradient descent uh, can optimize uh, this to, to a global uh, optimum. Uh, so there's a very nice uh, technical tool in this context. Maybe you'll find it uh, useful. Uh, so there's an integral. Right, if you need to, we need to calculate this risk, right? The, 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 the error, the expected error for some uh, model parameter uh, W. So there's a nice uh, integral uh, uh, mentioned in this paper by Cho and So uh, that said the expected value of a product of ReLU functions uh, uh, with the expected values over the input is just this nice geometric uh, function, okay? Uh, so imagine you have like two ReLU units and you ask what is the correlation between the outputs of these values if the input is a, a Gaussian uh, uh, distribution then this is the answer it depends on the the angle uh, between the uh, the the values in this uh, particular uh, fashion and on the norm okay uh, so the nice thing is that once you have this uh, expression you can actually calculate the expected risk uh, in closed form uh, so if you denote this function by g of u and v uh, the expected risk, namely the error, the expected error for a given uh, sort of candidate uh, weight W is just this function, okay? Uh, so as you can see, G, so this, this is the function G, involves uh, the angles between uh, uh, the two variables and their norms. Uh, so the overall risk has this nice uh, closed form. So typically you can't do this, right? It's hard to say, okay, I have a neural network uh, and uh, the input is distributed in a given way. Uh, what does the risk uh, look like? And it's nice that, uh, you know, in this case, uh, you can do this uh, using this uh, integral. So to answer one question about the activation function, we, can we know this integral for ReLUs, right? We don't know it for ReLU6. Uh, but you can actually can't, uh, do it for a sine function, okay? So for threshold, it's actually easy to do. It's even easier than this, because it's just a volume calculation, but then we, we can't do the rest of the analysis. So yes. in the case of the, the student who's learning from this Mm -hmm. distribution. <coughs> is he restricted to have the same filters? The uh, same as what? The same filters as the, the teacher, so to say. It's restricted to the, the same, same architecture. architecture. Yes. yes. So you, you, he's not able to, to choose another filter to learn you know, a filter that is more broader. Oh, no, no. No, it's proper uh, learning, is it, right? Uh, in the realizable case. Non realizable is, uh, or improper is harder. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, right. Okay, uh, so this is the loss function. It's nice and, uh, and closed form. Uh, and because it's, uh, it's so nice, you can analyze it. Uh, I mean, it's still uh, pretty technical to do, but you can analyze it. You can find its critical points and uh, its uh, structure. So what we find is that it has a non-differentiable max at zero, maximum uh, point. Uh, it has the global minimum W star, as you'd expect. Uh, and it, it has a degenerate saddle point at uh, uh, the direction opposite to W star uh, scaled by something. Okay, so these are the, the, the stationary uh, points. Uh, so because you have this uh, saddle points, it, uh, I mean, it's sort of intuitive that if this is the case, if this is a maximum point which you're, you're unlikely to get stuck in, this is a saddle point. It's a bad saddle point, but still a saddle point. Uh, then it seems... Uh, uh, likely that gradient descent will uh, converge, that it will not get stuck in these two points, but you still have to show it, and there are no, like the existing re results, there are some results by Gann, Lee, and Recht, and others, for showing that uh, gradient descent in certain non-convex non conditions will uh, globally converge, but they don't apply to this case because this saddle point is uh, bad. It's a nasty saddle point. Okay, so this is, uh, this donut is what it looks like. Say in 2D, this is the global minimum here, this is the saddle point here, and if you Focus on it. That's what it looks like. Okay. 
Uh, all right, so uh, what we could show, we could uh, prove that for this, uh, in this case, uh, for any accuracy epsilon that you want, uh, you can uh, gradient descent, so this is not stochastic gradient descent, gradient descent will converge in order of one over, over epsilon squared iterations to the global uh, optimum within accuracy uh, epsilon. Okay, uh, so you have to do some uh, non-convex uh, optimization uh, analysis, so, so the key idea is, uh, is, well, essentially you want to show that the bad points Right, I showed you that there are two sort of stationary points there. Uh, you want to show that they're avoided, right? That the, uh, the gradient descent will not get stuck uh, there or uh, drift over there. And the way to show this is that uh, if you look at the path of gradient descent during the optimization, uh, there's uh, throughout the path, the function has a, is Lipschitz continuous gradient uh, with a certain uh, constant. And then you can apply sort of standard non-convex optimization tools to show the rate of uh, convergence. Okay, uh, so that's uh, basically the idea. So what we've shown again is that uh, for this particular architecture, the non-overlap convnet, uh, if the input distribution is arbitrary, it's hard, and if it's Gaussian, it's easy. So I wanted to have a graph that shows this. Uh, so uh, we, uh, what we did here was to find some true network with parameters W star, and we only changed it in uh, its input distribution. Uh, for one case, the red case here, the input distribution was Gaussian, and this shows the uh, GD running. So for the Gaussian case, as our result uh, predicts, uh, GD converges to the global uh, minimum. And for the non-Gaussian case, we uh, chose this distribution uh, where GD uh, gets stuck, okay? So it's actually hard to fail. You know, once, once you get deep learning to work, sometimes it's hard to get it to fail, like to find instances where uh, uh, things get stuck. And the way we found this instance was going back to the combinatorial optimization problem, this set splitting problem from which we did the reduction, find a hard case for set splitting, and then encode that as a learning problem, okay? So anyway, this shows the gap between hardness and uh, tractability uh, depending on input distribution. Can yeah. you verify that this is a local minimum? Uh, this one? Well, we know the global minimum. Oh, you know the global minimum? Yeah. It's it's uh, realizable again. So there is a W star. It's the same W star actually. I mean, it's exactly the same uh, uh, model that generates the data. Okay. And what about, um, so you say sample size? Is it for a large sample size or? Uh, so this is uh, uh, I don't remember the number. It wasn't something. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, the theory is like infinite yeah. sample size, right? But we find that it actually happens for uh, you know fairly small samples. Uh, so we need, there is a gap here that we need to show this for sort of the finite sample case, but people have shown that, you know. Well, I mean, back in the days, there was always some, some relation between the number of parameters in the network and the examples, mm -hmm. and this was called alpha, and then you would go, like, um, and have, have this, um, you know, have the small sample size compared to, to the number of parameters or the very large sample size. Yeah, no, I expect it'll be the same, I mean. Right, exactly. It's a, s a standard learning curve. I mean, when you have too few data points, it doesn't specify the, the uh, true model well enough, and then there might be problems with optimization as well. We, we observe that for very few data points, it's, uh, the optimization can break too. Okay. Yeah. So what was the non-Gaussian distribution? Uh, uh, so we generated, from we have this reduction from set splitting, so uh, it it's basically has finite support. You take some graph uh, problem, uh, set splitting problem, it's, it's a discrete problem, and you encode it so it's it's discrete. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think having a continuous distribution is key here, right? So it is because this is what smooths and uh, uh, symmetrizes the whole thing. Okay. So Gaussian is as sort of smooth and symmetric as you can go, uh, and I think that that's the sort of magic that happens. Okay. Uh, okay. Just a quick word about overlap. So this is we assume no overlap in the uh, in the model. So when you introduce overlap. Uh, uh, local minima do uh, points do uh, uh, appear so as uh, as here, so we can show that uh, when you have overlap, even small overlap, there are local minimum, uh, local minima. But uh, empirically, we found that uh, these are not sort of bad uh, local minima in the sense that if you do multiple restarts. So, for example, here, if you do multiple restarts, sometimes you'll end up here, uh, here, and sometimes you'll end up here. And that's fine. As so, uh, like once you end up in the good minimum, you're done, right? So if the, the basin of attraction, there aren't too many local minima, and the uh, basin of attraction are, are uh, reasonable, especially for the global one, 
then you're fine, right? But this is uh, harder to analyze, and we, we haven't learned that yet. Uh, so yeah. then in this case also, if you go to down Gaussian, things become hard? So this is already for Gaussian. So for Gaussian, you have the, the multiple. Well, so I think uh, for uh, Amir's analysis, uh, since you're using this property of that one, mm -hmm. it will work also for, uh, I mean, something like block Gaussian. You don't oh. have to have a giant Gaussian. As long as block Gaussian, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, with each block, uh, as long as it's fairly symmetric, it will work. So we can write the objective. The closed form thing we can do here as well. That's not a problem. We just can't, and we, we should not be able to show that it, there's one uh, minimum. Okay, so writing the objective that that's fine, the closed form stuff, that that we can do anyway. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, there have been like in the rec uh, last year uh, and uh, more recently a lot of results for the Gaussian case, because uh, apparently you know other people have found it uh, 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 nice to to analyze. So this is a partial uh, list, but uh, uh, actually the Cleveland's paper. Uh, provides uh, weaker distribution assumptions uh, looking at the spectrum of uh, the data and put a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff but I think it's a good uh, nice toy toyish model uh, to work on because it preserves some of the difficulties but uh, gives hints as to why things might work okay so that was the first part uh, so now I'd like to uh, switch to a different model where we explore the uh, effect of both uh, uh, optimization and generalization okay uh, so as I said before, uh, it's a you often see uh, models that have a huge number of parameters and are trained with fewer data points than parameters and still manage to generalize well, right? So it's a big uh, question uh, in terms of uh, sort of learning theory and optimization, uh, how that can happen. Uh, again, and there's a lot of recent work on that. Uh, so we'd like to find a case, and uh, uh, what I'll show you is a case where there's uh, an architecture that's uh, sort of standard. Optimization here is uh, SDD. Uh, and we show that generalization is possible even if you have many more parameters than uh, data points. Uh, and of course, we need to make assumptions again because we'd be uh, if we show something general here, we'd be sort of refuting both learning theory and optimization theory, and we don't want to do any of that. Okay. So uh, the assumption we make uh, is uh, fairly uh, strong. Uh, but we think it's instructive for analysis. So we assume that the data itself, the data that you learn from, is uh, 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 generated by a linear classifier, okay? So the, the teacher uh, generates data from a linearly separable rule, okay? Uh, so we all know that that's we, we can learn that, right? Uh, using perceptron if we learn with a linear classifier. But the twist is uh, here is that we want to learn this using uh, a neural net with one hidden layer, right? So it's not at all obvious that if you take data that is generated by something simple and try to learn it with something complicated, it's not obvious that you'll be able to find uh, something with a uh, low error, and it's even not uh, less obvious that you'll be able to generalize well, right? So you're trying to learn with a very complex architecture, right? One hidden layer that can be arbitrarily uh, uh, wide, uh, has many parameters and nonlinearities, so it might get stuck at suboptimal points, not finding even this, uh, you know, a uh, simple uh, linear classifier, and it might overfit because it has all these parameters, right? So we can find really funky uh, uh, separation, uh, uh, which might not generalize well at all, okay? So that's what we wanted to study. And uh, to make it even simpler, we, f we assume that the second layer is fixed and has weights that are just minus one and one, okay? So in terms of expressivity, it's uh, as expressive as uh, two-layer uh, networks because all you need is, is the different sign. Uh, I mean, uh, networks with one hidden layer. Uh, but it makes the uh, analysis simpler, okay? All right, so uh, uh, just a few points about that. So clearly we can learn linear classifiers, as I said before, but our interest is in understanding how to learn this with uh, 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 this more elaborate uh, uh, architecture, okay? And using uh, SGD, okay? Uh, so the key question is, uh, will SGD find a, a good solution? Uh, and if it finds a good solution, namely a solution with uh, zero error, will it generalize well? Okay. Uh, so there has been uh, work. I mean, this idea of studying linear classifier in the context of nonlinear architectures has been, uh, you know, uh, brought up before uh, by Gori and Tessie and our and uh, others. But it doesn't. There are no results that we know of that uh, provide both optimization and generalization uh, uh, guarantees. So that's what we aim to do. So here are our results. The first is an optimization type guarantee that says that SDD can find a zero error uh, classifier in polynomial time, okay? Uh, and the proof, the idea for a proof is uh, it's sort of uh, 
perceptron uh, proof on steroids. Uh, so it's uh, the same idea of bounding the, the dot product with the true vector and the norm of the, uh, the model. Uh, but it's, uh, it's more uh, elaborate because, um, because of the nonlinearity, obviously. Uh, uh, and we show that this for, for this uh, solution that SG defines, right, the solution that SG defines in itself is not a linear classifier, right? It's a nonlinear classifier, and it might be, you know, uh, arbitrarily complex, and it's not clear that it would generalize. But what we can show is that the gen generalization error for this thing that SG defines is uh, 1 over n log uh, n over delta with probability at least 1 minus delta. And this does not depend at all on the number of hidden units that you have. So the number of hidden units can be arbitrarily large, and you get the same uh, generalization guarantee. Uh, and the, the idea for the proof is that it actually uses the first part. So because SGD converges quickly, namely it converges in a polynomial uh, number of uh, uh, samples, it implies through compression bounds that it will also generalize well. Okay, so there are these uh, compression bounds are a very nice uh, uh, you know, family of generalization uh, results that basically says if your data, if your model uses a, a small subset of your data, then it will generalize well. Right? If it manages to compress your data and uh, and uh, uh, get low training error with that, then you'll get a correspondingly low generalization error. Okay, um, so that's the idea. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm not sure I mentioned that, that uh, the activation that we're using is not as leaky ReLU, okay? What we have the proof for is leaky ReLU with some constant uh, leak, say alpha, okay? And the surprising thing, uh, somewhat surprising, is that for ReLU, namely non-leaky ReLU, so the one with the zero slope, uh, this actually doesn't work. So there are cases where SGD will get stuck. We can construct a fairly simple example where SGD will get uh, stuck uh, uh, and at a local minimum, and then namely it will uh, not find a, so, uh, a classifier with a zero error. Okay, so it's sort of a, dip, I don't know, uh, maybe a funny situation where you give uh, this uh, very uh, complex model a very simple rule and it gets stuck and it doesn't find uh, even a linear classification rule. And the reason why it gets stuck is uh, the so-called uh, dead ReLU uh, phenomenon where, so this is a dead ReLU. Uh, uh, where you just do uh, values get to a point where they, they saturate at zero and uh, then nothing happens, right? They get no gradient. So what happens in this uh, counter example is that uh, uh, the ReLU you can initialize with high probability, you will initialize at a point where all there are sufficiently many uh, dead values and then it can go nowhere. And if you have a leaky ReLU, I guess that's why leaky values were invented, you still have some gradient uh, and that's why the analysis work in works in that case. Okay, so this is just shows, uh, to show that it works. This is binary MNIST <laughs> with uh, 4,000 uh, labels, 2,000 each. And this is training error and this is a uh, test error. And you can see that even with 1,000 hidden neurons, so this is much more uh, parameters than, uh, many more parameters than training points, uh, you get both uh, zero training error and zero uh, test error. Okay, uh, so moving on, do I have time? Okay, three minutes is good. Uh, so just to uh, give a taste of uh, this uh, more uh, recent work of ours, uh, this we put on archive. Uh, so it's a problem uh, we it, uh, sort of came out of a vision problem of mapping uh, uh, images to uh, the semantic representations of the, the objects in the image and their relations. So this is uh, known as a scene graph. There's a very nice uh, data set uh, from Fei Fei Li's group called the Visual Genome, where you have images and these uh, corresponding uh, graphs, okay? Uh, so we were looking at this problem and we wanted, so this is sort of a classical structured prediction uh, problem where you have complex uh, uh, label uh, uh, outputs. And we wanted to uh, sort of think about how what it means to have a deep learning architecture uh, for, for this uh, problem. So, I mean, there are many people who have looked at the uh, uh, related problems also in this uh, meeting. We've had like, I think, uh, it uh, was, uh, was brought up in Klaus's talk and uh, in Les' uh, talk and uh, others, uh, uh, and in your talk as well. Uh, this issue of how to build uh, uh, architectures for uh, complex uh, and structured uh, uh, input. Uh, so we tried to sort of formalize this uh, question, and uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you briefly. So this is the problem that we set to solve. This is an image, and we want to find an architecture that will map it into this uh, 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 visual uh, uh, semantic graph. Okay. Uh, so 
it'd be nice, generally, not for just for this problem. When you think about an architecture for a given uh, task, say a deep learning architecture, if you know of some invariances in the data, it'll be nice to uh, structure your architecture such that it respects those invariances. So for example, you know, this is a dog and this is the same dog, uh, if, we, if we turn it by uh, whatever uh, degrees. Right, so it'll be nice if we have a, an architecture that by design is just doesn't care about uh, 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 rotations, right? Uh, I mean, obviously that, that's been a goal of uh, deep learning uh, for a while, so it's not like we can uh, solve this uh, in the general case, but the idea is that if you're not invariant to uh, the invariances of the, the input, then you're just wasting parameters, right? I mean, uh, if, if, you're, if you produce a different output for this and for that, you've basically somehow just wasted your architecture, right? You've, you've spent uh, things where, where you shouldn't spend, if you, could, if you could actually construct something that was invariant by design, okay? Uh, so this idea of trying to formalize this notion of invariance, um, I mean, it's, uh, it has uh, roots uh, that go way back, but at least uh, uh, you know, even in uh, recent year, uh, there have been uh, different works trying to, to understand it and at least design architectures that are uh, invariant by uh, design to certain uh, permutations of the input. Uh, so this nice paper de called Deep Sets uh, in uh, recent NIPs, which uh, formalized this nicely. Uh, so our question was how can we apply this to uh, this problem of scene graphs, okay? Can we define some invariances that we thought, uh, we think should be uh, uh, the, the this architecture should respect and how we can we find an architecture that does this, okay? Uh, so I'll uh, skip this. So uh, the point in uh, these types of problems is that context is key. So for example, if you just look at this part of an image, uh, then it's hard to s exactly understand what this thing here is. Maybe you saw the complete image before, so you know it's an elephant, but if you just look at subsets of the image, then it's not clear. So context is key. It's really under, uh, important to understand how the different uh, objects in the image uh, uh, interact with each other and how they're uh, correlated. Okay? So, you know, a typical structure prediction or graphical model uh, architecture for this type of problem is to say, okay, I'll, I'll have an architecture that looks at pairs of objects and says, you know, tries to analyze this uh, pair uh, to give, to understand what's likely to be in this pair. So, for example, this is likely to be a woman and a man. And if you look at this one, this is a, it might be a woman and an elephant, but it might also be a woman and a tree. You're not, uh, you know, it's not clear from this. And then you'll want something that takes all these pairwise uh, beliefs, if you want, and integrates them. So this is what uh, we would call gra uh, inference alg algorithm in graphical models, like BP, like Leo was mentioning. Uh, and uh, then uh, it would integrate all these things and spit out a, a result, okay? So we wanted to think of uh, sort of the most general uh, architecture that we, uh, we could think of that does that type of thing, but it's not necessarily like belief propagation or some, something else, okay. So basically what we did is to uh, uh, specify the invariances that we want, and the invariances are that at least if you change the order of things in the input, so you change the order of uh, the boxes and uh, stuff like that, you'd want to have the same output. And we, we uh, proved the general uh, sort of a theorem that says what the architecture should be in order to satisfy that. And we showed that if you do that, you can get uh, nice uh, architectures for attention. Uh, and we showed that it works well for uh, visual genome. Okay. So sorry for being over time. And uh, so conclusion is optimization and generalization. There's a lot of uh, interesting uh, theory to be done. Uh, Gaussian simplifies things and architecture design is uh, very interesting and it's, it'll be nice to formulate it. Thanks. We, we can have uh, just a short questions. In the middle part, we talk about the you, your first you rely on using HD. If you use some other optimizer, do those results still hold? Or is it really relying on? So uh, because it's a linear classifier, you can cheat, you know, it, it, and say, OK, I'm ignoring everything except uh, the, and then, then just do perceptron, right? So we want to have a handicapped algorithm for this because, because the problem is trapped. Uh, but you could ask about, I don't know, Adegrad or uh, second order methods, yeah. and we haven't analyzed that. Uh, we haven't tried. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing because our results for Adegrad say that they have, the, you know, like Ben uh, and Nati's result, uh, uh, the inductive bias is different, then it's not, it's not completely obvious. Okay, so uh, so let's close this this uh, talk. So let's proceed to the next section, uh, next talk.